Hey, before we get into the episode, I just want to point out two creators that are making a lot of great Flame Tower resources, especially because I did not have enough time to set you up for the format in ways I would normally like to. The first is Two Per Spellbook, a blog that I've talked about before. If you're in any of the Discords or Facebook groups, chances are you've seen this. But Alexander has been doing killer work covering the format, the pages, and even posting some decks that you can train against. The second one is a YouTube channel called Meta Zookeeper. Meta Zookeeper has over a dozen games on YouTube within the Flame format playing it. So if you just want to see someone play, get an idea of some other decks that might pop up, that is also going to be a great resource. I love having games on in the background while I'm doing other things. It just helps you notice interactions and things that you might expect. Check them out, tell them I sent you, and now on to the episode. Welcome to Towers, a MetaZoo podcast. Flame Tower is upon us. It's happening this weekend in Texas. It's going to be so hot, and I'm very excited for it. I've been so wrapped up with both testing and then just trying to clear out work so that I have enough time to do the tower and to test, but I wanted to get two episodes to all of you before you get to the tower because I think this is going to be really important. And today's episode is about IDing, intentional drawing, and how I almost ID'd my way out of top 32. First disclaimer, this is going to be a peak towers episode in that I still don't really understand the format that these tournaments go through. I just know we play all of our rounds, even if you do good or bad, which I really like for an event you have to travel to. Based on your ranking, you're going to get paired with other people of similar ranks, and you can try to ride this into going to day two to top cutting. And I also know about points. If you win a match that's best two out of three games, you get three points. If you draw a match or tie, you get one point. And if you lose, you get zero points. Generally, depending on how many participants there are, you need a certain amount of points to top cut. And in this way, you can kind of figure out where you are at in your day, what you need to accomplish to get to day two. An intentional draw is when you look at your opponent and you say, let's not play, let's just draw. We're both going to get one point from this. So let me take you through a not so hypothetical, which was my experience at Earth Tower. I won my first match, and then my second match, and then my third match, and then my fourth match. So I am sitting pretty at 12 points. I know that Earth Tower has less participants than Water Tower, and so one more win will probably get me in top cut, but I wanted to be sure. And I'm looking back at Water Tower, where I saw people drawing out. They had done really well. They did not need to play any more games. That was going to save brain power. And it was also going to keep eyes off of their spell books, which might give them an edge the next day. And I have a little panic because on the one hand, I don't know how any of this works. And I really don't want to risk not going to day two by drawing out games and having it not work out for me. On the other hand, I didn't want to sabotage other players unnecessarily if we could easily get into top cut. So I ran around and I asked a bunch of people a bunch of questions. Judges and tournament organizers, of course, cannot give you advice on what you should do, uh, but they can give you the amount of people and you can go and plug it into calculations. But I didn't really understand those calculations. Uh, I talked with a bunch of people and for the most part, people were like, look, you should be able to draw the last three games that will be the equivalent of another win and you'll be fine you will get to tomorrow at the time i was like first or second place i was at the top tables position and so it seemed safe oh but i was nervous and something people kept mentioning to me they said there's a player who doesn't id like he'll play you if you go against him so keep an eye out for that if you need to draw three games to get to the next day and you get paired against this player and they beat you, you're now in trouble. You're going to need to play out another match and hope you win. But everyone impressed to me that like with all the people there, it was very unlikely I was going to face that player. So I sit down for game five, not quite sure what to do. I kind of want to play it out. After all, I had won my previous four matches and felt really good about them. And if I just needed to win one more, three shots at winning one more match seemed likely. 
But I was sitting across from a member of the ludicrous Lads of Loveland, which is a team that is near and dear to my heart. And we chatted a bit and he said, do you want to ID? He was cool if I didn't want to. This is really important. You cannot pressure or manipulate your opponent into IDing. It has to be something you both present and agree to. And I said, sure, let's do it. And we had a really nice time. We had a chat. It was really nice to give my brain a rest. I saw the appeal of drawing out. Time went up. I ate a snack. Things were good. We wait for the pairings for round six, which was going to be the second to last. And a fellow walks up to me and says, hi, I don't ID. Do you want to play a feature match? Remember that player that people had warned me about before? Well, that's Michael Galarza. And I got paired with Michael Galarza. Once more, there was only one game after Michael. So I had to play Michael. And if he beat me, that meant if I didn't win my next match, like there was a good shot. I wasn't going to make it to day two. However, if I beat Michael, I was guaranteed a spot in the next day. And I'd never done a feature match before. He was really friendly. I said, absolutely, let's go put on a show. And a show we did. It was a highlight of my MetaZoo experience playing that feature match with Michael. He was the dream player to go against when it comes to competitive edge and attitude. Just very positive, very methodical. If you go back on the Twitch and you watch our game, you'll see us gesturing at our cards a lot as we explain where bonuses are coming from, where damage is going to. We made it very precise. And in the end, I ended up beating Michael. We had this really funny moment where I had a Zalvitz with a giant's blood on it that was going to swing for game. He did not have a lot he could do with it. And so he played a second giant's blood on my giant so I could go for a big swing. I felt great after that match. I was very glad I ran into Michael. I felt like I had truly earned my spot in day two. And the stakes... Knowing if I had just played my match previously, I would have had two more shots at getting to day two. Knowing that if I lost to him and lost the next game, that was it for me. It was a peak experience. Because Michael played out all of his matches, he ended up in first place. He had one defeat the whole day, which was me. I was undefeated, but I had had my draws. So second place it was. The next day, we both got knocked out the first round. But because we had ranked high, we ended up getting 17th and 18th respectively, which I was thrilled with, this being my first time going to Top Cut. So I talked to Michael about intentional draws, IDing, why he doesn't do it. And I think he has a really interesting perspective. Caster, what's your name? My name is Michael Galarza. I'm coming from Dr. Cards and Gaming from Seymour, Connecticut. Shout out Dr. Cards. And uh, I understand you got first place yesterday. Yes, I took uh, first place in the Swiss bracket. I went six and one. So six wins, one loss, no draws. Yeah, who, who, who could you lose to? I wonder. Oh, I could imagine he's holding the microphone in front of me currently. You know, um, so I had a really fun experience with you where I was also undefeated and Everyone at the table is drawing, and I was like, I don't, and I'll talk about this on the podcast later. But you came up to me round six, and I'm like, it's risky taking a draw because if someone doesn't want to draw, then that could be it. And you said, hey, I don't draw. Do you want to play a feature match? And I was like, let's do it. Why don't you draw? Um, I come from a background where I play fighting games, and the brackets for fighting games are double elimination. You can't draw, and even if you do draw by the mechanics of fighting games where you both deplete each other's health at the exact same time, you, you had to play the game still. They just make you replay that game that would cause you to hard draw out. So on top of that competitive spirit of just kind of having like actual wins and uh, losses, in card games, since it's a Swiss bracket typically, there's a bubble that exists. So if people get to a certain point in which they can just draw and then work on their opponent win rates to stay in that bubble, it kind of creates the situation where instead of a top 32 based on just wins and losses, it becomes a top 10 for those players who are having to like grind out games after they get to that two and two record or three and two record. For seven rounds, for example, at 4-0, people were just drawing out, and they would end up getting 15 points total, which gets them in so long as your opponent win rate's not that good. And if you're losing early rounds, your opponent win rate's going to be kind of lower on the end. So it's really inconvenient to get bubbled out after playing your ass off, losing your first couple games, and then just being like, oh, wow, I won out. And then you look at the bracket, and you bubbled out, and you're 33rd place, and you should have been 32nd, 31st if the entire top roster for the last three rounds wasn't just draws. Like, actually played it out. Exactly. So it draws just kind of dampen the idea of, like, how much emphasis and control you have on how well you do in an event. You can always just do poorly and not feel bad. You can always do well and not feel bad. And then there's that in-between. And I don't want as many people in between as we usually see in this, like, event format. Yeah. How much do you think, like, teams and team size factor into this? 
Is um, it more the concept of ID in general, or do you think the teams also influence? I think it's both. Um, in general, IDing is a favorable thing for people who are traveling, and I can't knock people who ID because, like, people like, like you, Esther, you're coming from California. It's really expensive to get here. You're coming to New York. You're not gonna just because you can maybe get into top, try it out that way. Other players and things like that, they're they're okay with it. They want to guarantee those slots. So sometimes they're more. It's funny because you think it's about guaranteeing your spot, but most of these players are playing like a dice game. Yeah. They're like they're four and zero. Oh, maybe I can just get in if I just draw out from here. It's not a guarantee, and you still played well. Like I honestly felt relieved when you came to me and you're like, let's play because I was like, okay, this is a huge risk. And I already had the title of an episode of a podcast in my mind of how I missed out on top 32 <laughs> undefeated. I love that. Right. And so I when you that. came and played, I was like. Because you could have knocked me out of top 32 and Absolutely. all together. Yeah. And said we got first and second. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, that, that was great. Yeah, to, to answer the question on the team idea, yeah. um, it's beneficial, of course, because like when we're, we're working with a team, we work with an owner, of course. Like That person's here to sponsor the team, bring them to events to make the money back to make the next event happen, right? Right. But there has to be some sort of thing happen. There has to be some sort of skirting to this process because if we have teams that are as big as Castro Society for example not saying that they ID'd a lot or anything just like the size of Castro Society is a lot bigger than our four-man team for example so if there's a lot of people as they're good players and everything well, yeah, GG unit had 11 people here right exactly yeah. so like these players who are expected to be in the top spots and top seats anyway if they start IDing it starts to become more and more of like that situation where I said instead of a top 32 it's really the bottom 10 that you're writing you're fighting for after you don't win your first two rounds so it can be really disheartening to see like, oh, I'm not sponsored, I'm a solo player. How, do I really even have a shot unless I just go 6-1 or if I go 5-0? It's just like you need to have the benefit of the doubt for the players who are here by themselves, the integrity and the competitive spirit of just wanting to play the games. Because again, like I said yesterday, I didn't buy a bunch of cardboard to not play the cards, right? right. That's the idea. That was me going to today. People are like, are you nervous? I'm like, I like my cards and I want to play with them. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely, yes. Sir. So when you're at Flame Tower this weekend and you find yourself piling up the wins, do the math, figure out your position, and decide if you want to play it out. Looking back in hindsight, everybody else who drew, which was most of the top tables, they got to day two just fine. There was not as much risk as I was worried about. But you should be prepared for this situation and add it to your to-do list before the tower. Luckily, once you make it to day two, you have to win to get ahead. If you lose, you're out. That's it for this episode. Wanted to keep it fairly simple. We have one more coming up that covers a very key concept that you will need to utilize at Flame Tower. So keep an eye out for that. Can't wait to see you all there. Until next time. Towers, a MetaZoo podcast was created by me, Esther Ellis. The cover art was made by Chandler Candela. Music by The Heatley Bros. More details in the description. Want to say hello? Follow the show on Instagram at Towers Podcast. Send me an email at towersgamepodcast at gmail.com and say hi in MetaZoo's Discord servers. Many of the figures in MetaZoo originate in indigenous lore, and I think it's important for me to acknowledge that I make this podcast on the traditional lands and home of the Tongva Nation. This game presents us with a rich opportunity to get in touch with the living cultures that surround us. And I hope you can take a moment to reflect on the history of the land you stand on, and the figures and the cards you play.